Welcome to Revealing Jesus. Are you hungry to learn more about our beautiful Savior Jesus? I am your host, Christina Pereira, lover of Jesus, apostolic leader, licensed and ordained minister, author, podcaster, and kingdom party planner. Did you know that the Bible declares that grace and peace are multiplied to us in the knowledge of Jesus? And that simply means the more we learn about our beautiful Savior, the more we will experience all He died to give us. Join me for all things the King and His Kingdom, including revelatory teaching, interviews with Bible ministers, media leaders, authors, and more. Come discover the beauty of God displayed all across the body of Christ. Together, we are revealing more of Jesus to a hurting world today. The Bible is so different from anything else because of the stories in it and the teaching in it get inside us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Even though I was not a Christian yet, God was already calling me. But before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to our Christina Prayer Ministry sponsors who help support the mission to unite the body of Christ and fulfill the Great Commission with love. A big shout out to Gopher Ministries who provides all of our equipment for our gospel events. Davis Financial Services who does all of our financial accounting Harvest Family Network, through which I am licensed and ordained, and Life Changing Productions, who helps put together evangelistic events to reach our city for Jesus. If you or your organization are interested in becoming a CPM sponsor, you can find out more information on our website at ChristinaPereira.org. Do you have a loved one special occasion coming up? and don't know what to get them, well, now you can sponsor an episode of Revealing Jesus in their name. And you can give them a special dedication message read on air. It makes a great gift. To find out more information, just go to christinapereira.org slash podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. I am your host, Christina, and I'm so excited to have you with me here today. I hope and I pray that you are doing well right where you are and enjoying the continuously flowing favor of grace pouring from our beautiful Savior and Father in heaven. I've got a great show for you today. I have an amazing leader in the body of Christ with me. He is a versatile and creative author, editor, and storyteller. He has written and collaborated on more than 60 books. And he is the author of the new book, The Book That Conquered Time, How the Bible Came to Be. I have with me here today, Rob Suggs. Rob, welcome to the podcast. And I'm delighted to be here, Christina. Oh, well, I'm so excited to have you with me. When I saw your book, I was just thrilled because anybody out there who's listening to this podcast knows that I absolutely love the Word of God. And it's just such a beautiful and a precious gift. So thank you for taking the time to combine all of the history and everything behind it. It's truly fascinating. Well, again, I was excited to be invited to speak on your show because I know it's a very special podcast and I'm looking forward to talking about the Bible with you. Yay. Oh. Well, I'm excited too. Before we get started, since this is revealing Jesus, I have to ask you how you met our beautiful Savior, Jesus. Okay. I love talking about that. There's really a couple of vignettes. Um, one of them is before I met Christ. I was about four years old mm -hmm. and I've never connected this story and seen how God used it until recently in my life. And it kind of hit me like a lightning bolt, what God was doing. But I was four years old and sitting on our living room sofa, and my dad was reading me my Sunday school lesson. The lesson was the story of little Samuel, who was growing up in the home of Eli. If you remember that story at all, his mother devoted him to God's service, and he stayed by the priest, Eli. So at nighttime, he heard the voice calling his name three times, and each time he went to Eli and said, did you call me? And Eli said, no, it wasn't me. Go back to bed. And then he figured out finally that it was God. Well, it's a simple story. But when dad read me this story, I immediately jumped off the sofa and said, now let me tell it to you. Now, for one thing, 
I always wondered why I remembered that so well out of everything. You don't remember much from being four years old, but that story is just clear as a bell. Why do I remember that? And then I realized that when you're a child, it's all about hearing stories. The three bears, the three little pigs, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, all those wonderful stories. But you hear them as a child and you're not prompted to retell them immediately. But when I heard this Bible story, something in me just kind of swelled up and said, retell this story. And that's what the Bible does. The Bible is so different from anything else because of the stories in it and the teaching in it get inside us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Even though I was not a Christian yet, God was already calling me. And you think about it, the story he used was about a little boy hearing the voice of God. <laughs> so I kind of cherish this now. Well, later I was baptized and so forth. But when I was 16 years old, I really still didn't know God personally. And I, I read a couple of books that were in our house that were about miracles of the modern world. One of it was David Wilkinson, mm -hmm. David Wilkerson, the cross and the switchblade, which was a classic back in the sixties and so forth. And it just shocked me because here were biblical style miracles happening on the streets of New York among gangs. And it just kind of riveted me. And I got down on my knees and I prayed to God and I said, Lord, I don't know if you're real or not. Yeah, I go to church. I hear the stories, but if you're real, I want to feel you. I want to know that you're real. And immediately he kind of flooded me with a, a sense of his presence. And I've had it ever since. I mean, God speaks to us very, very clearly when we're first coming to know him. And I've, there have been many times where I've said, God, I need to know you right now. And he counts more on my faith. But at that point, when I asked him, I, I need to know your presence, he was there for me. Mm -hmm. And since then, it's been a pilgrimage, coming to know him better and better and soaking up his wisdom from the word and walking in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that. You know, it's amazing to me. The reason why we share testimonies on Revealing Jesus is because each and every one of us has a different and unique testimony. And I think it's so beautiful that we get to listen to them uh, yes. because somebody out there is going to relate to that testimony and they're going to say, me too, me too. Or they're going to say, I want that. And it's going to spark something within them, a conversation that they can begin to have with Jesus. Jesus can reveal himself to them. So I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's beautiful. Well, it's the greatest gift we're given is when God gives us a personal testimony, because that's something nobody can take away from us and nobody can explain away. Absolutely. And my hope truly is that people will listen to these episodes and they'll hear testimony after testimony of different person after different person. They're going to say, man, this Jesus is really real. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much. Well, I've loved reading through your book, the book that conquered time, how the Bible came to be. Can you share a little bit about why you say the book, the Bible is the best selling book of all time? Because I think those statistics would be really incredible for our listeners to hear. Well, the specifics are basically that every given month, if you look at the bestseller list, and you'll see, gosh, I don't know who some of the best selling authors are, but think of the books that we buy that are thrillers, mysteries, romance that are on the top of the bestseller list. And these authors make millions of dollars. The Bible outsells every one of them every month. So that in any given month you mentioned, after 2000 years, the Bible is still the best selling book in the world. It's not just cumulative, it is ongoing. It, wow. it sells many times more than whatever the best-selling nonfiction or fiction book is. And so that's one of the most amazing things I think I discovered in the writing of this book is that people just keep buying the Bible. They just keep buying it. Now, whether we're all reading it, that's another question. <laughs> but the Bibles are out there, and we are so privileged to have Bibles on our shelves that we can freely read in our own language. and that's another thing the book gets into. Mm, I'm so thankful for that. I know in my house, 
I can't even begin to count how many we have. I probably need to give some away so that other people can share them. But I just bought my daughter her first Bible and she's eight and it's beautiful. And of course, it's got this precious pink sparkly cover, but I inscribed it and I dedicated it to her and it was so precious. She was so excited to get it. And I'm so thankful for that. You know, in reading through your book, I had so many thoughts, but one of the things I thought was, wow, if the early church fathers had not decided to compile these specific books together, we wouldn't have access to the word of God like we have now, which I thought, man, what a great tragedy, how different my life would be and the lives of so many had we not had access to the word of God. Can you talk a little bit about why they chose to canonize scripture and what their intentions were? Yes. First of all, you use that great word canonize, and I always remind people it's C-A-N-O-N with one N. It's not a big good, but as you were saying, it's the collection. You used it exactly right. It's the collection of books that are accepted without qualification as the word of God. And yes, it is amazing that the gospels survived, that these ancient books written on parchment and and as letters for other people that were so perishable survived Mm -hmm. all this time. And then that the church fathers chose the right ones to remember. And the only way we can explain that is obviously the Holy Spirit, because think of all the errors that could have been made because there are other gospels that we don't have, and time has proven them to be frauds. There's one called the Gospel of Thomas, and it's full of error. It was not written as early as the Gospels we use, but the early church fathers knew which ones were real. They knew which ones were actually connected to disciples. So they said, the Gospel of Matthew, we can trace back to the disciple Matthew. The Gospel of Mark, Mark was a disciple of Peter. Mark was not a disciple of Jesus originally, but he came along later was a disciple of Jesus. Of I'm sorry, of Peter. And so in the Gospel of Mark, we have the teaching of Peter, which is just amazing. You know, because the closest disciple to Jesus. And that's the first gospel written. So the early fathers knew this, and what they went by were they said, which books are being used, which books is the Holy Spirit? using among the churches. Number two, which ones are connected to the apostles, the original 12 apostles? Mm -hmm. And they went by mainly those two things. And so it really didn't take hundreds of years. Almost immediately, the books that we have in the New Testament were accepted as the real ones. And there were one or two others that they read. The Shepherd of Herbos is the name of one of them. It's around today. You can read it but it's not part of the Bible. It's profitable, it's good, but you know, it's, it's not what God chose. So time has borne out the books that the early church fathers chose to be our Bible. Mm, I love that so much. And just to give people some context, you know, when the early church was first formed, there was such a tradition of storytelling. And a lot of times they would repeat the stories of Jesus to the church members. But as the original apostles died off, they realized that they needed to put into account so that they could preserve the teaching of the apostles. And also, too, Paul even talks about it in Galatians and other places. And uh, There were false teachers. So there were people going around writing letters claiming to be apostles who weren't really the original 12 apostles with Jesus. And basically, they were causing a lot of uh, dysfunction in the church. Paul mentions them specifically, the Gnostics and the Judaizers are just two of them. Yes, yes, absolutely. And again, we have to look at this and think so many counterfeits sprung up immediately. I mean, even before any of the books in the New Testament were written, there were already false teachers. Mm -hmm. So how do we move through all of that and we come out with books that have lasted for 2,000 years? I mean, we've had all this time, if any of them were, the books we, in our Bible were false, if any of them didn't bear out, we would know it by now. Mm-hmm. But again, that can only be the work of the Holy Spirit because Absolutely. 
there were Judaizers, as you mentioned, that wanted to kind of move the gospel backwards and require Judaism to be part of, you know, including circumcision, all those kinds of things. And then on the other hand, there were people that wanted to strip Judaism out of the gospel, which you also can't do. Because Jesus was a thoroughgoing Jew. He knew the Old Testament scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Half of what he said, he was quoting from the Old Testament. So to understand Jesus, you have to have the Old Testament. So there's this intricate balance of things that are required. Understand who Jesus is. And the books in our Bible get it exactly right. Paul gets it exactly right when he comes along. And by Mm -hmm. the way, people forget, Paul wrote before the Gospels. Mm -hmm. So Paul begins to write within 20 years at the most after the resurrection of Jesus. So it's still with the memory of people that are still alive at that point that can remember when Jesus was resurrected from the dead. People think, oh, well, the gospel is legends that were a hundred years later. That's not true. The gospels, first of all, Paul writes about the resurrection two decades after it happens. And then the gospels just say, well, here's the full story of Jesus. And the Gospels come along about 20 years or so after Paul. Mm, That's so good. You know, and I just want to say this out there. I love that you mentioned having the old with the new. And I think it's beautiful. So the New Testament reveals what was hidden in the Old Testament. The New Testament brings to light all of the things that Jesus said. And so if we go back and we look at the Old Testament, both the law and the prophets were both created to testify to the coming Messiah. So you need both. And oftentimes when I'm sitting with the Lord and I'm reading in the Word of God, He'll link both Old and New Testament together for me. And I call it like pieces of a puzzle. So He'll yes. bring a New Testament concept and an Him revealed in the Old Testament, and they just come together and form a concept. And uh, it's so fascinating. If you go back and you look at the interlinear interlinear- concepts, it is perfectly linked each one between old and new. And I completely agree with you. I trust the Holy Spirit that he has gotten what he wants into this book that has so stood the test of time. That is a great comment. I was talking about this book the other day, and I used the exact same metaphor of the puzzle piece. And I used it in this way. This is the problem. We go to church or go to a, a, a whole Bible study, and we study a little piece of the Bible. It might be a story. It might be a teaching from Paul. It might be something from the book of Revelation, whatever it is. We study a tiny little piece of the scripture. Now imagine you're a new Christian and you come and you think, well, this is a great little, we studied first Corinthians 13 about love by Paul. That's a wonderful thing, but you don't get the full puzzle from the puzzle piece. Right. And most of the time we're lacking that full puzzle. Mm -hmm. Now I grew up in a culture where people, at least I felt like people knew the Bible fairly well. And I mean, I was just fortunate enough that I was trained in the Bible all the way when I was growing, all the time when I was growing up, I even had a New Testament course in the Old Testament that told me the whole story. So grateful for that. You know, God used it in my life. But most people, I think, don't see the unity of the Bible and even just the Old Testament. That is one story, one saga. Mm -hmm. And I think you can't see the beauty of it if you don't see that it's not just a collection of 66 books, but it is one book that comes together. This is, again, the work of the Holy Spirit, because men and possibly women over generations of time, over different cultures, over different nations, wrote this book, beginning with Moses, you know, all the way up through the writers of the New Testament. They wrote this book in all their different experiences and all their different personalities, and it all hangs together. It all hangs together as one story Mm -hmm. does not contradict itself. It does not argue with itself. It does not give you different ways to live. It's just remarkable that it does that. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be that way. I mean, we could never do that on our own without the work of God. 
Do you want more authentic worship and fervent prayer? Do you want to unveil the glory, purity, and passion of God's love? I've got a great resource for you with warmth and piercing insight. Global Apostolic Ministers Stephen and Renee Springer help you embrace God's purifying fire in their book, The Fire of Perfect Love, Intimacy with God for a Life of Passion, Purpose, and Unshakable Faith. When you make love the goal of your life, you won't burn up and you won't burn out. You will bring the transforming love of Jesus to your city, nation, and world. And Revealing Jesus listeners get 40% off and free shipping with promo code REVEALINGJESUS at familyownedbakerbookhouse.com. Pick up a copy today and experience the fire of God's perfect love. Just head to the link in the show notes. I know it's incredible. If you go back and you start looking at like the mirror images of scripture, like specifically even just looking at Genesis and Revelation, they are mirror images of each other. And it's truly remarkable. And if you go through and you just search out uh, the interlinary Greek or the Hebrew, you will see remarkable just signatures of Jesus all throughout the entire book. And it's truly, truly incredible. We talked a little bit about reading it with the lens of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that for a minute, because this is a living and breathing book. When you approach the Word of God, you are going to hear from God himself. When you ask the Holy Spirit to breathe on the pages of this book, let's talk about that. Okay. I have a lot of favorite authors, non-biblical, like I was an English literature major. So I love Charles Dickens, who wrote A Christmas Carol and... Mm -hmm. Uh, David Copperfield and Tale of Two Cities. Um, but I've never read any of his books more than once. I read them. I thoroughly enjoy them. I marvel over his genius and I put them aside. But I read and teach these books from the Bible over and over and over and over. They're never the same. <laughs> this, is, this is a paradox. Yep. The word of God is unchanging over time. It is one that is eternal. It is unchanging. And we're even warned against changing it, you know, I think in Revelation. But yet every time you teach the prodigal son from Luke, you're going to see something in there you never saw before. Mm -hmm. It was there, but the Holy Spirit is saying today, I'm going to pull out the story of the older brother, or today I'm going to pull out this part of the story. The word is living and the difference between it and other books is that it has a conversation with your life Mm -hmm. as you go through your life. Now, it's not the Bible doing that itself. It's the Holy Spirit speaking the words in the Bible and applying them to you. So yes, you're exactly right. It's a living word, which is the reason I wrote the book. I wanted to show that that's how it conquered time. It conquered time because it's beyond time. It is timeless. It is a word that God spoke through to the prophets It continues to speak to us today. And he does that again, people he spoke the word to. Imagine bringing Moses into the modern world so that he saw cars and the internet and all these things, television, satellites (laughs) and space. He wouldn't know what to do. He wouldn't know how to handle it. Ezekiel might, because he saw a few visions, (laughs) but Moses would be bewildered. And yet still the word spoken through Moses and through all the prophets speaks to our lives today. It's remarkable. I'm never afraid to teach any biblical passage. People say, oh, guys, did you see what the lesson is next week? How are we going to find a new thing to talk about? It's a Leviticus. What are we going to do? But there's <laughs> always something there that applies to what's happening right now because yeah. of the Holy Spirit. That's so good. It was so interesting because I had this conversation with my little girl the other day. I just mentioned we had gotten her her first Bible. And she was looking through the pages and she was asking me what to read. And I was like, well, how about here? And she said, mommy, I already read that. And I said, well, the most amazing thing is, is if you read it again, you're going to see something different. I said, the first time you read it, something stood out to your heart. Now this time you're going to read it and something different is going to stand out to your heart. And she was so excited. And I said, that's God speaking to you. And she was so excited. She kicked me out of her room and she said, mommy, I want to read now. Go. Oh, well, that's a mother who knows how to, and that's just great. That's fabulous. You know, when I was little, we memorized scripture. 
because we were all in the King James then, all these other translations. I'm an old guy. So all these other translations hadn't come out. So everybody was in the same Bible and it's written in that kind of elevated King James language with the these yeah. and thous. But that makes it easier to memorize, actually. <laughs> and so I memorized all these verses and God took every one of them and put them in my heart. So that now when I'm in some situation, he'll pull one out and use it like pulling a book off the shelf. Mm -hmm. So your heart is a bookshelf in which you can put all the words in the Bible. There are stories. I don't have any of them in my book, but they're stories about people in prison camps. I do have one story like, but I'll mention that one. That's probably yeah. a better example. I think you should this, share I, that. Yeah. Yeah. This is how the book begins. There is a prisoner. It was actually one of the books that I read when I was 16 or so years old that moved me so much. It was in our house and I picked it up and read it. It's called In the Presence of My Enemies. And this was a jet pilot in the Vietnamese War. He was shot down. The villagers whisked him off to a Vietnamese prison where he found himself with other American prisoners. And in the darkness of his gloom and thinking I may not get out of here alive, he began to think back on the Bible verses and hymns that he had learned as a child in church when he had barely been paying attention. But he still had a little bit of it. He knew a few verses, and he clung to those and repeated them to himself. And he began to ask the other prisoners. They had to communicate in code because the guards wouldn't let him speak. They communicated in code. Do you know any Bible verses? And all the prisoners pulled their collective knowledge of Bible verses. A few really knew some good verses. A few knew, uh, knew hymns because they knew the words to hymns. Some of the great old hymns have wonderful words to them. Mm -hmm. And so as they put all their collective verses together, everyone immediately memorized the new ones they didn't have before. So everybody had a Bible in their hearts. It wasn't a full Bible, but it matched what was given. And in this way, God spoke through all those prisoners and gave them hope and strength through the word. And, that, and as I hear that story, it makes me think, why haven't I memorized more of scripture? You know, why haven't I done that? Because when I do that, I'm giving myself a tool or I'm giving the Holy Spirit a tool that he can use when I'm about to get into an argument with someone or I'm about to get exasperated in a traffic jam or whatever it is, whatever those little ministry moments that God needs to speak to my heart. He'll use a Bible verse to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I love that we talked about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit always testifies to the word of God. He never goes beyond the word of God. And so I love that, you know, the Holy Spirit will bring up the word of God, passages that we've written or the scriptures we've memorized. And the most wonderful thing is, is I've found just in my experience, if you're reading in the word of God daily, if you're really reading it slowly and you're digesting it and you're allowing it yes. to transform you from the inside out, I always like to say it like this. We don't read the word of God. We eat the word of God. Jesus himself yes. says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And if, if we're on here talking about revealing Jesus, Jesus is the word of God, the word made flesh. And so it's so beautiful. So whenever we're spending time with him, he's uh, building those things inside of us. And just at the right moment, like you said, a scripture comes up and says, you know, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, just when you need it the most. Absolutely. And and it's so good. I, I can never imagine living my life without the living word of God. So if people out there want to get started, maybe get their first Bible, what would you recommend? There's so many different translations out there. What would you say to them? I would tell them to probably start with a readable translation. And I don't want to necessarily single out one or two, but there are a number of them that are the New Living, the you know the New International. There are a number of good trend. Most of the ones the ones coming out are readable these days. The ESV, the English Standard Version, is a very good Bible. Um, but I would get a good readable Bible, and as much as that, I'd get a good study Bible mm -hmm. because it has notes and it will help you with passages with little things you really need to know. Never depend on the study notes, but we depend on the Word itself. But the study notes can be a great help and a great assistance. And then, like you're saying, I want to come back to what you said about eating the word, because it sounds funny, 
mm-hmm. but it, it's absolutely true. Sometimes we'll read, let's just say, uh, a passage from Paul in our Sunday morning class, and we'll read it all at once. And then I'll look up, people are just staring wide-eyed, like, what was that? Like it was in some other language. And you can't just read 10 verses out of Paul like you're reading the newspaper or something. You have to take it a verse at a time, mm-hmm. which is how we really try to do it. And you have to read it with your heart. Mm-hmm. Read it with your heart and not just your mind. A lot of Bible study methods emphasize the mind. That's good. I mean, they're saying, you know, find an application, find a this, find a that. And those are good mental activities, but you have to read it with your heart to an open heart because that's what God speaks. The heart has to be open. And I know that it's hard to tell people how to open their heart, but I think they know what I mean. Just read it open and expectantly, expectantly. And if it's a new Bible, if you're doing this for the first time, Start with the Gospel of John. That's always, you cannot go wrong with a beautifully written Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. Jesus sits down with you like he does with Nicodemus and -hmm. tells you what it means to be born again. And Jesus' miracles are laid out in a lot more detail. They're full stories in John's Gospel. And it's a delight to the heart and to the mind to read. And thirdly, I might say, read it with a friend, maybe in a group, but Sometimes one other person can be great. It's just the two of you reading it together. Because then God has two of you. And there's not all those group dynamics. There's not all 10 people. There's just two of you, two hearts, you know, committed to the scriptures, reading together. Mm, that's beautiful. I think those are excellent, excellent suggestions. Before we go today, would you pray for our listeners? Whatever the Certainly. Lord lays on your heart. Let's pray together. Father, first, in gratitude, I wish to thank you for Christina and this wonderful podcast that I could just tell is abounding in your spirit. You are present here, and miraculously, I can feel it right through the internet, that you're present there, and that you're working and using the words she speaks to people who are listening out there. I ask you to use today's podcast to take maybe one thing. For each person listening, pull out one thing they need to hear and apply it to their hearts. I pray that you would be with all of our listeners today, wherever they may be, whether they're in a car, listening at home, listening with a study group, that you would speak to these people, that you would then make them aware that as they get up and they leave or they arrive where they're going in the car, whatever it may be, you go with them. Your spirit is there. Your Holy Spirit is there guiding them and encouraging them and offering them friendship. And finally, we thank you for your abiding word that is forever changeless, yet forever giving us something new. We pray these things in your precious heavenly day. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I know that's going to bless so many people, and thank you so much. It's great to be here. I have thoroughly enjoyed being a part of this podcast today. Oh, me too. We'll have to do it again. Yes, I would love that. I love the word of God. You're welcome back anytime. Well, I hope and I pray today's episode has blessed you. I will have links from today's podcast under Revealing Jesus with Christina Pereira. There you'll find additional resources to connect with us and our special guest, Rob Suggs. And don't forget to pick up a copy of The Book That Conquered Time, How the Bible Came to Be. And if you haven't gotten your first Bible, go out there and get you one. Until next week, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless. Beloved, let me introduce you to my King. He is altogether lovely. No matter which way you turn him, he is perfection personified. He is velvet and steel. He is meekness and majesty. He is glory and humility. He is kindness and strength. He is altogether lovely. And he is my king. And he can be yours as well. All day long, he holds his hand that you might take that you might turn one step, one grasp, one yes, 
one breath away from the arms of your loving Savior. Beloved, if you hear him calling today, do not harden your heart. The Bible declares that not one of us is guaranteed another moment upon this earth. So pray this prayer with me today and run into the arms of the one who loves you, who knows you best. Father, I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin, for all of the places that I have fallen short, God, of your glorious standard. I ask you now to send your Son into my heart to be the forgiveness of my sin, to be my redemption, to be my righteousness, to be my holiness, to be my sanctification. I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, to fill me with your Spirit, your power, your glory, that I might bring glory to your name, Father. I thank you that I receive all of this by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself up for me. I thank you that I am now a child of God, fully forgiven, fully righteous, fully holy in your eyes. And I ask you to help me walk out this life in a way that pleases and honors you, Father. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. I thank you for your love, for your kindness, for your great joy in saving me. And I thank you, Father, and I thank you, Holy Spirit. And I pray all of these things in your beautiful Son's name. Amen. If you've just prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to congratulate you. You are now a child of God, and all things are now yours. Keep listening to Revealing Jesus. Find a good Bible translation that makes sense to you. And keep hearing about our beautiful Savior Jesus. Please let us know. We want to continue to pray for you. And we want to send you a free PDF copy of our New Believer Workbook. Just go to christinapereira.org slash welcome hyphen home. Enter your email address and we will be happy to send this free gift and continue to pray for your journey. God bless. I sincerely hope and pray today's episode has blessed you. Now it's your turn to continue the conversation. We are all evangelists of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like this episode, rate it, share it with a friend. If it's impacted your life, let them know that you want it to do the same and theirs. Help spread the word of the good news of Jesus. Subscribe to the mailing list and get episodes, articles, downloads, and more sent right to you. Link in show notes or just text Jesus to 1-833-815-7778. Again, that's Jesus, 1-833-815-7778. We would love to connect with you on social media. You can find us at Christina Prayer Ministries on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Until next week, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of Jesus. God bless.